I want to thank everyone uh, again for coming to what it is the third and final event of our Amish public talk series, a series that has explored Amish life with a particular focus on the Amish community of Pinecraft here in Sarasota. And I've been happy to see how well attended our events have been. I was even talking to Jeff, who's the manager of the Carlisle and the uh, the Dutchman, and he was just telling me that the last event uh, in the Der Dutchman Facebook page was uh, watched over 1900 times, which, uh, you know, for this kind of event is pretty good. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Manuel Lopez, and I'm a professor of religion at the New College of Florida. Also, for those of you who haven't been to the previous events, a uh, uh, new college is uh, uh, the public honors college of the University of Florida system and it's next to the Ringling. And I want to welcome everyone to visit if you haven't been. We have a lovely campus by the bay. Um, I also uh, want to suggest that if you haven't been there, uh, you can also check out our website at New College of Florida. And uh, you can see that we have uh, regularly many events and talks and public performances and concerts. And if you go to the website and scroll all the way down, you can see uh, every week what, what events we have, and you're all welcome to come. Um, this public talk uh, series is also part of a class that uh, I've been teaching with uh, J.B. Miller, who was our speaker last week uh, at New College of Florida, about the history, practices, and beliefs of the Amish, again, with a particular focus on our local Pinecraft community. Uh, and as previous events, our students are here. So thanks for coming again. Um, our first event two weeks ago was a public conversation between J.B. Miller and Katie Troyer, who's also here with us today, um, which also opened the exhibition of Katie Troyer's photographs, which if you haven't seen, they're, they are outside still at the Carlo Inn, and they will be here tomorrow. And then beginning uh, on Wednesday, I believe it's Wednesday, March 1st, and for the month of March, is going to be at the a College Hall at the New College of Florida. So if you go to our website, you will also see that. Um, uh, last week we had a wonderful talk by Jamie Miller about the history of Pinecraft from the arrival of the first Amish in the 1920s until the 1970s and it was lovely to see so many members of the community here and we all learned a lot about uh, some facts about the history of Pinecraft. Uh, and today we're lucky to have Stephen Nolt, a professor of history and Anabaptist studies and director of the Young Center for Anabaptist and Piety Studies at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. Uh, he received his PhD in history from the University of Notre Dame and holds a graduate theology degree from Associated Mennonite, uh, Mennonite Biblical Seminary. Uh, his Amish related research has taken him into dozens of settlements across the United States and Ontario and has focused on community formation and history, economic and social change, and the role of technology in Amish life. Uh, Professor Noll is the author and or co-author of 14 books on Amish, Mennonite, and Pennsylvania German history and contemporary life. Uh, his most recent titles include The Amish, A Concise Introduction, A History of the Amish, and with Donald Cradle and Karen Johnson Weiner, uh, he wrote The Amish, um, and he also uh, wrote Amish Grace with Donald Cradle and David Weaver Zerker. Uh, today, Professor Nolt will have a talk, uh, Amish Across America, Growth and Change Among a Traditional People. Uh, and before I introduce him, uh, before I invite him to, uh, to talk, um, I want to thank our sponsors, the Mellon Foundation and Florida Humanities, whose funding has made these uh, events possible. We would not have been able to do uh, all of the events and the photographic exhibition with uh, the final <laughs> particular Florida Humanities. And today we're lucky to have the director of Florida Humanities, uh, Nashim Madiun, is here. So if you want to say a few words. everyone um, be very brief um, looking forward to the presentation as well uh, this initiative has been very successful and it also provides it also provides an opportunity for us to continue this type of work it is very rare that the research that scholars such as yourself make it to the public sometimes the research circulates among students but when it's relevant to the public wouldn't it be nice if we could continue around the state of, state of Florida to make it available in venues such as this? 
This attendance, I will tell you, is overwhelming. I understand in the past couple of weeks, it was more than twice this size, which is remarkable, 1,900 to 2,000 views. That is incredible. That type of metric sets the bar and standard for anything that we've been doing around the state. So you should be proud of yourselves, and we want to continue this work with New College and continue to unearth these remarkable stories. We have some free magazines that look at similar stories around the state in the back while they last. Was not <laughs> expecting this type of crowd. <laughs> but the magazines are free in the back. And if you want to find out more about some of the other stories that we are sharing across uh, this remarkable state in Florida, uh, go to Florida, Human Florida Humanities org. And the next issue of our magazine is going to look at cuisine in the state of Florida. So let's see if we can find where the best Cuban sound is. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, finally, I want to thank uh, Jeff and his team here at the Kyle Inn uh, for their generosity and sponsoring some of the events and hosting them. Uh, and with that, I will introduce now our speaker of today, Professor Stephen Null. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Manu, and pleasure to be with, with you this evening. Uh, good to see the students again and uh, other folks, uh, some of them I know from, from uh, other, other settings or from other parts of the country. So it's uh, great to be here. Uh, everything's just been lovely. And yet, in many ways, you are a tough audience for this topic because there are folks here who are Amish, folks here who grew up Amish, and other folks who maybe don't know much at all about the Amish, setting me up to <laughs> shoot down the middle and miss all of you. So uh, I uh, come to you from Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania, a college um, affiliated with the Church of the Brethren. Um, and <clears throat> my uh, task this evening, um, as, as Professor Lopez said, is to talk about the Amish beyond Pinecraft. So as I understand, and as, as, as you all know, uh, we had a, a series of events with the, the lovely photo gallery, um, and uh, then a talk a couple weeks ago on uh, the Amish of Pinecraft. And I've been asked to look uh, with you at the Amish beyond Pinecraft today. Some of what I'll be sharing, actually most of what I'll be sharing, is um, sociological, demographic, um, but I always like to begin if I'm not speaking about history, to, with a, a, a historic, a, a, an acknowledgement that historically and today, uh, the Amish certainly are a religious group. They are a church. They, they see themselves as a religious people. And so although that's not the focus this evening, uh, just to note Amish origins um, from the Anabaptist movement in the 1500s, Yachab um, Amun in 1693, um, converting to uh, Anabaptism about 1680 and uh, in the area around uh, Bern, which would be uh, in the, the lower uh, shaded part of the map there in Switzerland, and then in 1693 moving to uh, uh, saint marie Amin in what is now the Alsace region of eastern uh, France. Um, with uh, those who um, who rallied to his his more um, rigorous understanding of, of uh, Anabaptist church life that became uh, associated with his surname, the uh, Amun or the Amish. Uh, migration then to Pennsylvania in uh, two major waves, first uh, to North America in two major waves, to Pennsylvania in the decades before the American Revolution, um, and then descendants of some of those folks moving further uh, uh, west from Pennsylvania uh, in the 19th century, and then some other immigrants from from Europe moving directly to the Midwest or to Ontario uh, from the 18-teens through the 1850s. <clears throat> in the mid-1800s, in the um, Amish, community, Amish communities across uh, North America, there were a series of um, debates, um, some, sometimes quite uh, pointed, over the way in which the uh, Amish church should or should not adapt itself to changing American society. Um, uh, how much to adapt, how much to assimilate, how much to uh, stand apart. And the, um, actually it was a minority, probably about a third of the Amish church districts, uh, adhered to a, a more separatist approach that became known as the Old Order. First defined in terms of maintaining an old order of church life and ritual, but then perhaps not surprisingly extending that orientation to um, 
uh, more uh, older ways of life more generally in terms of dress and technology and, and occupations, but with considerable variation in the particulars, in the details uh, of, of uh, what that meant from place to place. Where that leaves us about 1900 is that there were roughly 5,000 uh, Amish people, uh, old order Amish people, uh, uh, adults and children, in 44 communities in uh, eight states and Ontario. That's a uh, century and a quarter or so ago. Last summer, when the Young Center did its uh, uh, annual uh, census, we counted approximately 375,000 um, in 32 states and four provinces, and we could update that now to 34 states because last fall some folks from southern Colorado moved into northern New Mexico, and another uh, Amish settlement is taking shape in northern Alabama, so we could say uh, 34 states. Um, so this is um, really remarkable growth, and one of the things that uh, one of the things that I wanted to start with because it has implications for. Uh, for Amish life in terms of the variety of contexts and neighbors and uh, economic situations in which Amish people find themselves uh, today. Uh, the, the sources of Amish population growth are no secret, uh, large families, uh, but also fairly high retention rates, as sociologists would say. That is the percentage of children born to Amish parents who join the Amish church. Uh, so nationally, probably around 85%. In, in certain uh, settlements, uh, it's as high as 93% uh, today. So all of that yields a doubling time of just over uh, 20 uh, years. That is the Amish population doubling about every uh, 20 years. Um, some, some visuals here prepared um, with the help of uh, David Luthi, uh, the late uh, Steve Scott, Edsel Burge, and Joe Donemeyer, with some maps by Donemeyer and Dale Jones. Um, if you notice, the, the red uh, dots are Amish communities in 1970. This is 1980. They'll just back up again so you can, you can, maybe there's a particular state or a particular county you want to focus on that you, that you recognize. 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2022. Now that's, uh, it's, it's, it's not quite fair with 2022 because the stars are larger than the red dots. So it does, <laughs> it does exaggerate, but the, 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 the geographic spread between uh, 2010 and 2022, the, the, the 20 teens, um, were really a remarkable. Uh, I'll just I'll just back up again if you want to. Yeah. 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2022. So each year at the Young Center, we uh, again with uh, the help of uh, a number of Amish folks and, and conservative Mennonite partners. Um, do a, a, a population, say if you go to our, our website that I have a screenshot of there, you can download a 12-page uh, PDF with uh, all of uh, the Amish communities uh, in, uh, in North America. We have a slightly less detailed, but we want to make it more detailed, uh, similar document for Old Order Mennonites um, in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we publish these numbers in the budget and the diary, and uh, we get some helpful corrections and feedback and additions uh, to the list, maybe from uh, some people uh, in this room, so we, we appreciate that. Um, so again, for, for tonight, the implications of uh, this growth in geographic spread. Well, a greater range of social and economic contexts, and so I just thought visually, um, since we have a screen uh, here, to introduce you to, uh, and in some cases this is an introduction because uh, maybe you're from these places, but. Um, well, probably not from the second. But anyway, uh, it introduced you to two very different social and economic contexts in which um, Amish folks live today and maybe have lived for some time. The Napanee settlement um, since 1842. Uh, now there are 50 uh, church districts there with an Amish population of more than 6,500 uh, people. Uh, this is a community that is um, highly industrial. Not, I mean, I'm not talking Amish, I'm just talking generally 52% of the workforce in uh, the county in which Napanee is located are employed in uh, industry. It's a very, economists would say, sort of lopsided economy. And the Amish are a part of that, uh, building uh, recreational, uh, recreational vehicles, uh, heavily involved 
in the RV industry. <coughs> um, <coughs> male household heads, Amish, I didn't put that in here, I guess it goes without saying, or, or not. Uh, Amish male household heads under age 65, in 1993, um, since 1993, like about six in 10 are working in industry in the Napanee community. The percent of um, working age men in agriculture in 2008 was only 6%. Um, so just see, see those, uh, those numbers are, uh, perhaps if you're, from, if you're from Napanee, this isn't surprising. If you're from a different Amish community, if you're not familiar with the Amish, these numbers might uh, be uh, startling. And then these last numbers from 2008, um, soon after these numbers were compiled with the Great Recession, uh, major layoffs, Amish people and non-Amish people working in industry in Napanee lost their jobs. There was a big question of what would happen. Um, would the uh, would industry um, come back? What, how would it come back? Would, would um, for my purposes, would the Amish occupational profile change in the wake of the Great Recession? And it turned out it did not, um, that is, it did not change. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the industry that was there came back just about as strong as it was before, and by 2015, um, uh, there was some small shift into uh, small business ownership, but the percentage of Amish men working in industry was basically back where it had been before, and the number, uh, the number of farmers <laughs> had not gone down, but as a percentage, that same sort of flat, staying flat number of farmers was a smaller percentage in, in the Napanee community. Um, all of this in this context leads to considerable disposable income and um, uh, Amish people on a regular basis, uh, you know, you'll see eating in restaurants, shopping at Walmart, whatever. So let's go visually to another um, Amish settlement. This one, uh, 400 miles north in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. This is a place that, uh, believe it or not, given its remote locale, I visit with some frequency because this is where all my in-laws live. Uh, no, they're, they're not Amish, but I mean, this is the, this is the area that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm visiting. Um, Amish folks started moving there in uh, 2008. There are about 140 uh, Amish adults and children there now, um, uh, 15 uh, years later. And uh, shopping at Walmart or eating at McDonald's isn't really an option for these Amish or for anyone else uh, who lives there, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, it's... it's uh, not densely populated, uh, let's, let's put it that way. The um, economic opportunities are relatively limited, um, but the economic um, constraints are also not quite uh, what one finds in Napanee. Property taxes are very low, uh, other, other things that one could, could mention. Um, some of the housing stock uh, now lived in by Amish folks are maybe not, doesn't strike one as traditionally uh, Amish agriculture. That's because there were a lot of abandoned or semi-abandoned homes that Amish people bought, recited, uh, re-roofed. Um, um, so just some other pictures here. Um, unlike the uh, Napanee Amish uh, schools that have nicely paved uh, basketball courts and uh, uh, ball field, ball diamonds, um, the school here, uh, the Amish school here is mostly known for chopping lots of firewood uh, because most of the school year, uh, it's just really, really cold. Um, there have been some efforts to try to connect with some of the summer backpacking tourists that come through the area, uh, and that's been somewhat, uh, somewhat successful. Um, and uh, there's someone who's uh, selling some uh, quilts um, and actually uh, using, using the, the, uh, the Amish name, as you can see in the, in the, the, the sign, to attract a, a bit of attention. So just... It just use those, those two different communities as an example of a very different Amish worlds. It's, um, um, it's, it's different being Amish in Napanee than it is in Engadine, Michigan. And um, one could multiply across the um, 500 or so Amish settlements in America and, um, and nearly replicate that range of diversity. And implied in, in the, the previous two examples uh, is the uh, and, and you saw with, with the Napanee occupational uh, figures, a range of occupations outside of farming. So the po population growth um, has, <clears throat> as, and as you saw in the maps going from 1970 uh, to the present, population growth, uh, a doubling time of every uh, 20 years, is kind of forcing the spread of the Amish population, right? It's not possible 
to for everyone to remain in their home communities. There just isn't enough space, even when not everyone is is, is uh, farming. Um, and <clears throat> so, so population growth is um, expanding the Amish world geographically, which is sending people to uh, areas where the type of agriculture that they may have, you know, at one point uh, engaged in, in, you know, just isn't possible. Uh, dryland agriculture in Wyoming is different than mid 20th century um, mixed crop dairy farming in Holmes County, Ohio, right? So uh, people are moving to new places with new environments and uh, taking up new lines of work. So many of the new Amish settlements are, have, are started by people who are looking for a, a more rural environment, but not necessarily looking to farm, or at least not necessarily looking to farm the way their grandparents uh, did. So uh, agriculture, uh, even even as it exists, is changing, which I'll uh, say in a moment. Um, some some numbers uh, from the Lancaster, Pennsylvania settlement, uh, where I come from. Um, these are numbers that are now about seven years old, but um, uh, farming still relatively more common in Lancaster than it was in, say, Napanee. About 35% of um, household male household heads under 65 were farming, about 45% in small shops, mostly woodworking, metalworking, 10% uh, in construction and related trades, and if we round off, about 10% uh, in, in uh, retail stores. Um, and, and again, we could I could go on with many slides of particular snapshots like that of, of occupational profile, uh, where you go from you know, sort of like almost no one farming to some people farming, different things folks are doing, Jaga County, Ohio, some factory work as well as we would see in Napanee and so on. But even in the ag sector itself, where people are uh, farming in Lancaster and elsewhere, there has been the shift from early 20th century mixed crop uh, dairy to often intensive produce farming. And I map here of some produce auctions in Ohio, similar maps you can find on the ag extension pages for Pennsylvania and New York and, and elsewhere. And so produce farming and providing produce for, uh, wholesale produce for uh, grocery stores, chain stores, um, for restaurants and so on, uh, has, has also been a way to continue in agriculture and continue uh, multi-generational uh, family uh, work in agriculture, but on a uh, smaller you know, plot of land, say five acres. Um, so it, it, does, it, it, it does allow for uh, a greater population density in areas where uh, agriculture may still be, um, still be uh, preferred. Another way of thinking about uh, the, the variety or the diversity of Amish communities today is to think about their histories and political contexts. So I have three examples here, and again, I'll start with, um, start with Lancaster. Um, but in the, the Lancaster, Pennsylvania community, there's a long history, long pattern of um, local civic participation on the part of, of many um, Amish folks um, with volunteer fire companies, with uh, EMT service. In fact, many uh, rural volunteer fire companies would frankly not exist in Lancaster County without Amish participation. And there's been, there have been some studies uh, across the state of Pennsylvania as volunteer fire companies are in some cases, unfortunately, aging out of existence, and there's sort of a, a crisis of providing uh, first responder care in rural areas, uh, and that's not the case in Lancaster and a few other heavily uh, Amish population, uh, Amish populated communities uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and entire families are involved with uh, the fundraising and, and funding for these entities. And this has, so this is, this is a history of civic participation that also extends uh, in some ways to, um, a certain amount, not not as much as the media would, uh, media stories would suggest, but a certain amount of political participation and, and voting. Actually, not really enough uh, folks voting to really make a difference in any election, but it, it is uh, it certainly is a is is a fact. And uh, I've seen letters from uh, as far back as 1918, when the congressman representing Lancaster County says that he's reaching out to the Amish bishop in Laycock Township, sending him a few sample ballots that I've conveniently marked to indicate how my friends plan to vote. So and he, was, he was hoping, his name was uh, Congressman W.W. W. Greist, and he was hoping that, that Bishop Stolzfus could distribute those for him. Um, in a place like, to switch back to Napanee, so uh, in a sense there's also a, a kind of, of economic integration there in terms of, in terms of um, working in, in local, uh, local industry, but there's not the same history of civic participation 
Uh, it's just, just a little different. And we see, again, just to use this one measure, voting is not the only uh, measure of, of um, uh, civic participation or, or engagement with one community. But uh, rates of um, uh, rates of registering to vote uh, and, and voting are very low in Napanee, much lower than in Lancaster. I mean, Lancaster, it's like somewhere between 10 and 20 percent given an any given election. It's not super high, but uh, it's much lower in Napanee. Then uh, we could go to a, um, a much older, dating to the 1840s, so 1840s, an old and by many measures much more conservative traditionalist Amish community in western Pennsylvania, the New Wilmington community, on the border of Lawrence and Mercer counties, uh, north of, roughly north of Pittsburgh, I guess you'd say, close to the Ohio border. Um, this is the community that has probably the highest rate of uh, voter participation and voter turnout of any Amish community in the United States. And that might be surprising if you think of, of the New Wilmington community as being, you know, uh, relatively more, shall we say, sectarian as compared with um, some other uh, Amish communities. But again, there's a particular history there, a particular history that involves connections with several key local lawyers and support that those folks provided the Amish community in their struggle against participating in uh, Social Security and gaining Social Security exemption and so on, that, that's, that's particularly focused in that community and has resulted historically in, in uh, again, in Amish terms, really remarkably um, high rates of, uh, of voter registration and, and voter turnout. Um, again, not the only way to measure, uh, civic engagement, but um, one particular way. Amid um, all this diversity, what might be some uh, common threads? Although common threads that also are going to uh, are going to to uh, have some of their own uh, variety. Um, one of them uh, is uh, the rise of Amish schools. Um, so, for uh, this comes as a surprise to some people who are learning about. Uh, uh, Amish history and life for the first time, but Amish schools are a relatively new development, okay? So there are a couple exceptions here and there that we can uh, identify, but for the most part, Amish, uh, distinctly Amish schools don't really start coming into being until the 1950s. There's one in Delaware in the 20s, and there's uh, two in, in Pennsylvania in the 30s, but um, it's, it's, it's mostly a post-World War II uh, development, and um, legally found, uh, sort of found, found legal, uh, uh, a, a, a legal arrangement that was struck in Pennsylvania in 1955 that more or less set the pattern that was used in other states, first in Ohio and then in Indiana. Um, famously, Wisconsin refused to uh, follow the lead of these earlier states, and so uh, Wisconsin ended up by 1972 in the U.S. Supreme Court case, Wisconsin versus Yoder. But sometimes that court case has kind of loomed so large that we've forgotten that for the most part, the development of Amish schools was, uh, you know, was was relatively amiable um, in terms of mid 20th century um, uh, American politics. Not entirely, but but um, you know, uh, in uh, in in some ways, it it, it really was. Um, so Amish schools are a relatively recent uh, phenomenon. So Amish children were attending rural public schools, generally one or two room schools, with their non Amish neighbors for most of the history of, of uh, common education in America from the 1830s onward, and many of them continued to do so in the 1950s, 60s, even 70s, depending upon where they lived. And in parts of Holmes County, Ohio, and parts of Elkhart and LaGrange counties, Pennsylvania, there are still Amish children attending public schools, only through eighth grade, but uh, attending uh, public schools. If we go to um, Elkhart and LaGrange uh, County, Indiana, uh, counties, Indiana, um, we will see that, or we do see in recent decades, that a greater share of Amish folks are uh, attending Amish schools. Um, so this is the percentage of Amish children in Amish schools in the Elkhart LaGrange settlement. Uh, so this would be near the Napanee settlement that I that I have been talking about uh, before. Um, so back in 1979, about half of Amish children were attending Amish schools. Uh, <laughs> In 2018, it was about 72 percent. Again, we can look at geography, settlement, um, settlement growth, population growth as at the root of this shift. Um, going to a public school is um, generally the choice of parent. That, I mean, sending Amish, send, Amish parents sending their children to a public school is generally the choice of Amish parents who are sending their children to the public school that they themselves attended. 
as the Elkhart LaGrange settlement has expanded geographically, as it's moved further east in LaGrange County, as it's moved further south into Noble County, and so on and so forth, um, more Amish people are not living near the public school that they went to, and they are, are less apt to send their children to a uh, public school with which they are unfamiliar or with which they don't have a history. So the uh, Amish schools that have been built in this settlement um, have tended disproportionately to be in the, the geographically newer parts of the settlement. However, as we see in the, um, the um, excerpt uh, here, the, the, the image from the Northern Indiana Newsletter de Blatt from about a year ago, um, in very recent years, um, there has been a, a, a really rapid uptick in the construction of Amish schools. So we see there, for example, on line three, uh, we have nine new schoolhouses this year instead of just four or five. So the, the, the pace of uh, school construction um, there has increased. So I imagine the next time we look at an Amish school census, um, I would guess it's even without having many years passed that it will, it will be in the 80% uh, range. Um, as I uh, said, we see uh, continuity and change even in these common threads like uh, education. So an example of uh, change in, uh, in, in the midst of continuity would be the School Vest Project in southeastern Pennsylvania that started in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, um, but throughout, um, in 2014, um, but is now you know, broader, broadly throughout southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, Kay Moyer, who was a nurse safety educator, uh, actually sort of still is, although she's retired, but she just doesn't stop, uh, and works with Amish schools as a Penn State Extension educator going into the schools doing uh, safety and health uh, teaching in Amish schools. Um, worked with some Amish mothers in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania to create reflective safety vests for kids walking to school um, along uh, narrow country roads. And uh, last count, uh, Kate told me they, that uh, she and her volunteers had uh, distributed 14,000 vests, and that was a couple years ago. So they may have slowed down a little bit during COVID, but um, they're, they're definitely uh, still, still at it. So just one example of um, uh, new things that, uh, that, are, that are happening in, in, uh, in the field of, of Amish schools. Um, something else we might mention, uh, and this is a little harder to quantify, but stories anecdotally that, uh, that I gather or read about or people, uh, Amish friends, tell me about across the country in the last 20 years has been uh, the rise of what they call supervised, what, what are called supervised youth groups. So these are youth activities that are, um, that are more uh, family, parent, parent planned um, and uh, have, have sort of a different um, um, yeah, just kind of a, a different tone and character about them. Um, um, often coming out of the concerns of, of parents who uh, want something different for their children than maybe they remember from their own uh, their own uh, youth years. Again, I don't I don't I don't have any numbers for this. I can't quantify it, but I, I would I would call it at least a grassroots movement that's that's sort of percolating uh, in various places across the country. One of the other things that um, is, a, a, I think, a really remarkable uh, development that is, I'm not sure it's all that widely known outside of the Amish world, has been the explosion of Amish print, Amish periodicals, um, that uh, we, we try to, at the Young Center, um, I know there are some other, other uh, colleges and libraries that also try to collect or subscribe to all Amish periodicals, and it is difficult. There's like a new Amish periodical about every other month um, and and the periodicals advertise other new periodicals, and so this is this is a very this is a very uh, very limited list. So I, uh, the, the first ones are of course the, the well known weekly uh, newspapers, the Budget and the Boatshaft. They're uh, Pathway publications. These are publications that were started by the Amish owned Pathway Publishing <coughs> Company in, in Amherst, Ontario. Um, anyway, there's there's just a range of things. These are some of these are targeted at particular um, particular uh, demographic groups, some are trade journals, even the trade journals like Buggy Builders Bulletin is not just going to have things of interest to buggy builders, they're going to have a recipe column, they're going to have um, a section where they're talking about who's getting married, uh, it's, it's more than just, uh, more than just um, you know, what kind of, uh, what, what's the latest technology in elliptical springs. Um, so, uh, and, and you, you'll find also uh, that, that there are, so this is a common theme, but again, 
there's variety within this. So um, I did not list Little Red Hen News, but the last one I have listed is Ladies Journal. So if you, it's a great comparison. I have students look at uh, Little Red Hen News and Ladies Journal. Little Red Hen News is uh, Amish women's magazine for um, generally the, the, let's say the, the more conservative end of the Amish spectrum. Um, it's black and white, no photos. Um, not highly edited, I guess would be a way of, of uh, saying it. But the interesting thing is that when you read it, it's an Amish women's magazine, but when you read it, the articles are not, the articles are about uh, family lives that are so, um, so sort of integrated, they're not, they're writing about uh, family activities in which everyone, men and women, children and adults, are all working at things together. There's not actually a lot within it that's very specifically for women, okay? It's, it's, it's one of the, one of the um, uh, sometimes counterintuitive things I think my students find is that among the most traditional groups, the, um, it's not that there aren't, you know, it's not that there aren't clear um, gender roles, but the, the the integration of family activity is such that it's it, things are described in much more holistic terms. <clears throat> Ladies' Journal um, is a, a much more polished and colorful um, periodical, and it's much more explicitly aimed at women uh, readers um, in in ways that are that, that's that's uh, different from uh, Little Red Hen uh, news. Um, another example I just thought I'd, I'd pull out because again this connects back to um, developments and changes in also in education. So Life's Special Sunbeams, this is a um, monthly magazine that uh, originates in New Holland, Pennsylvania but has a, very much a national uh, readership. It grows out of some work that began in 1975 with the S. June Smith Center which was a uh, child um, uh, Healthy Development and Child Advocacy Center in, uh, in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that began working in 1975 with Amish schools on providing special ed services and, and other kinds of things and doing training for Amish teachers to uh, better work with a range of uh, special ed needs in, in the Amish community. <clears throat> and by 2005, one of many outgrowths of that was um, this newsletter uh, with articles by teachers and by parents of um, children with, uh, with particular uh, medical or developmental uh, needs. Long stories, uh, long stories meaning stories that are submitted uh, to, this, to this magazine going into um, often great and very personal detail about uh, a family's experience with, um, with the uh, special children that they believe God has, has given them. I'd like to um, you know, conclude this evening with um, something that I, I conclude sometimes with, with some of my students, which is um, to talk about the worlds, uh, one way of thinking about the worlds in which we all live, whether we're Amish or not. And so we, we talk about um, how the Amish make, make meaning in the world in which they live, and perhaps a different way than, say, my students or I make meaning in that same world. We, we are living in 2023 in the same nation and um, sometimes are, are making, making meaning in, in different ways within that same context. And we think about this over time, and we think about how our worlds have changed. And I sometimes um, like to set this up as three worlds that are somewhat chronologically successive, but also uh, there are pieces of all of these that continue, um, that, that overlap and that we all live with. The world, the world of the kitchen table, the world of the assembly line, and the world of the smartphone. The world of the table, the kitchen table, um, these are metaphors, I hope, hope it's clear. Uh, the world of the kitchen table, the table is uh, a place, it's a common place for many different kinds of things. Um, it's a place for eating, for talking, for work, for recreation, for worship, a place for all generations. Throughout the day, different people and activities are in the same space, and sometimes those activities are a little hard to categorize. Something that is work might also be recreational, depending who's sitting around the table. Something that might 
uh, be a meal, might also be um, an aspect of worship, depending who's around the table and how you're, how you're construing it. Um, uh, we can think about the, the kitchen table as a metaphor for, say, um, Amish schools in which multiple grades are all together in one place, or the way that church is held in the same space where the family had earlier eaten breakfast, uh, or might bring in hay tomorrow, or carry out shop work on, on Monday. Um, some things may happen at certain times at the table, um, but time and place are not usually pulled apart uh, or, or, or separated. Um, it's, it's, uh, the meal is common food for everyone uh, who's there. The world of the assembly line, uh, pioneered by Henry Ford, uh, most famously, and others, was um, a world of, of specialization, a world where uh, we tried to pull things apart, including time and space. One thing, in the assembly line, one thing happens at a time in a particular place. So each space is used only for certain times and only for certain things. The goal, of course, of the assembly line is scale, consolidation, separation, and specialization, with the ultimate goals being efficiency and increased output. And I'm describing this assembly lines as in manufacturing terms, but it's a, it's, it became a model and a metaphor, particularly in the 20th century. Work was separated from leisure, residential space was divided from commercial space, hence zoning ordinances that started in Irvine, California, elderly to age-defined retirement homes, consolidated schools, bring lots of students together and then divide them and separate them by age and ability and on and on. There's a classroom where the only thing that happens is ninth grade English and in the next room, the only thing that's going to happen is 10th grade algebra and so on. It's, it, it's, it's separating things by in, in time and space. Work, um, uh, work becomes the, the, the model for uh, and, and, and the metaphor for um, other aspects of life. And now we have the world of the smartphone, where speed and quantity remain the goal, as they did with the world of the assembly line. But efficiency now comes from not separating, but collapsing time and space. We work from home, we shop at work, we have on-demand entertainment. Time and space are merged together. Um, there are, in many uh, schools across the country, no more snow days. It doesn't matter what's happening. Um, you know, with the weather, you can always have school, um, no matter where you are, and, and almost no matter what uh, time of the day. Um, the the internet, the smartphone, wireless technology, all these blur um, blur uh, the separate categories of the assembly line world. So, with that blurring, um, does that mean we're back where we started with the table? Not really, because the collapse of time and space is not the same thing as the integration of time and space. The individual is now divided, in many uh, cases, by uh, divided from, from other individuals by perhaps online anonymity or by particularly curated communities that uh, can, um, can, can vary. So uh, whether, whether we are um, living Amish lives or non-Amish lives, formerly Amish lives, some other uh, sort of uh, life that we are find ourselves making uh, meaning uh, in the world of the smartphone with some legacies of the world of the assembly line. Um, I try to maybe mostly remind myself, as I remind my students, to try to find some place to uh, put a kitchen table uh, back in our lives or to find some way to make meaning around a table uh, as well as around a screen, as well as around an assembly line. I think there's uh, supposed to be some time for questions and answers, and I took the liberty of calling it questions and considerations because I'm not going to promise answers. <laughs> but I will, we will consider questions, and uh, depending what they are, maybe answer them. Thank you. Thank you. In, uh, if, the, if a decision is made to start a new school, uh, how does one go about finding educators, reimbursing educators, and how does teachers' colleges work in that whole ramification of... Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, 
first of all, one, one thing to, to note is that uh, almost all Amish schools are taught by Amish teachers, which means that they themselves are graduates of, uh, of Amish schools. Uh, mm -hmm. So they have not attended high school or college themselves. Um, there is a little, I'll just stop you. There's, there, there's a, 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 an anecdote um, from, oh, I think this was from probably the 1960s maybe. There was um, the first Amish school in Northern Indiana that was opening, um, well, yeah, it opened in the late 40s, and then to me, this is in the 50s. Anyway, there was an Amish school teacher um, there named Eli Gingrich. He had moved from Plain City, Ohio, and um, there was some thought, since this was the first Amish school in Indiana, that maybe he should take one or two college classes. Maybe that would, this was, I think it was in the 60s, because it was, it was right around the time they were negotiating the agreement with Indianapolis in 1966. That maybe that was sort of smooth, over it. and he um, he decided he would take an e there was a teacher ed class in the evening at Goshen College, which was near where he lived, and he arranged for a driver to take him. And on the first night of that class in September, there was such a fierce thunderstorm that uh, the driver uh, never came to pick him up. He never went to class, and he decided that that was that was sort of <laughs> divine will. And uh, so that's, that's the closest I've ever heard in that story from Eli Gingrich, who's not living anymore, uh, that um, uh, the closest I ever heard to even a consideration of college education. But that's not, your, your question sort of is more, more broadly. Um, so Amish teachers, how are they recruited? Actually, in many ways, they are recruited in the same way that, um, that public school teachers in, say, 1900 were typically recruited, that is, uh, particularly gifted or talented uh, students, generally female students, would be shoulder tapped after they had finished school and invited to be school teachers. Um, you will see advertisements, notices. I, I had a, I don't know if one of the things I had listed up here is like a, uh, there's a bi weekly, um, I'm, the specific example I'm thinking of is the Geauga Post. Um, um, and there's classified ads in there, and there'll be notices for this school is looking for a teacher, this school is looking for a teacher, and, and so on. So there's sometimes there's there are formal ads, and, and people will move from other places, but there's also a lot of informal uh, shoulder tapping. I'm just curious about the status of the Pennsylvania Dutch language. Yeah, so um, Pennsylvania Dutch is the, the first language of uh, virtually all Amish people in America. There are uh, a, 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 a number of settlements where there's a different uh, German dialect. It's typically called Swiss, uh, Amish Swiss. It's not really like the German spoken in Switzerland, but anyway, it's, it's known as Swiss or Amish Swiss. Schweizer Deutsch, um, um, so that's that's not Pennsylvania Dutch, but generally Pennsylvania Dutch is the um, the the first language of everyone. Amish schools to connect with the school. Amish schools are conducted in English, uh, so some Amish children, if especially if they're the oldest in the family, they may not really be very functional in English until they go to school. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, Pennsylvania Dutch remains the the, the first language throughout the community. Um, throughout the communities. Um, uh, you know, there are some families uh, and some pockets in some settlements where English has become just very, very common nowadays. But I would say for the US and Canada as a whole, those are those, um, those cases, meaning cases where, where English is, is almost as common or maybe perhaps a bit preferred over Pennsylvania Dutch are really exceptional. Um, um, but they, they do exist here and there. But, but you know, um, church is going to be primarily in Pennsylvania Dutch. I mean, the, the readings from the Bible and the texts in the in the Alsbund Hymnal are in Standard German, um, High German. So um, there certainly are important, um, uh, essential, let's say, essential aspects of being Amish that, that rely that rely on uh, knowing and speaking uh, Pennsylvania Dutch. So it is alive and well. A friend and colleague um, in. German languages at University of Wisconsin Madison, um, uh, who specializes in Pennsylvania Dutch, says that Pennsylvania Dutch and Yiddish are the only two growing minority languages in America. Uh, numerically, that's yeah. Uh, 
I'm currently enrolled in a course, Learning Pennsylvania Dutch Online, by a person called Douglas Mavenfor. I don't know if you know him. I know who he is. I don't actually know him real well. He's from Kutztown? Howard. Yeah. To my surprise, I'm Dutch from the Netherlands, my native tongue. And I assumed he was either Amish or uh, Old Order, you know, some kind of Mennonite. Absolutely no Mennonite background, connection. It's all Lutheran. Do you know it? Can you tell me anything more? Are there other Lutheran communities where they speak Pennsylvania Dutch and how great, how big are they? Do they go back to 200 years, 300 years? Yeah. Okay, good question. Um, so are there, say, uh, Lutheran or German Reformed communities that spoke primarily Pennsylvania Dutch? The answer is yes, like 100 years ago. Uh, so, uh, very, very few, um, so uh, Doug Manafort is, is kind of unusual in his, in his demographic now um, for, his, for his age and his social position, but if we were to say uh, suddenly transport back to 1830 uh, in Pennsylvania, the vast majority of Pennsylvania Dutch speakers would not have been Amish or Mennonite. So Pennsylvania Dutch is an American derived dialect that came from the, the melding of several different um, um, German uh, tongues in Pennsylvania, and it was spoken widely by the wide range. There were like eighty thousand, uh, you know, eighty thousand um, immigrants from German-speaking Europe who came through the port of Philadelphia before the American Revolution. They came from different parts of mostly the Rhine Valley, uh, and they they in a sense created a new language when they were here. So it was spoken widely by all those people. And it would have still been in, in parts of Pennsylvania, in Berks County, Schuylkill County especially, um, Lebanon County, by non-Anabaptists uh, up through the 1940s, and then by some older people into the 50s, 60s, 70s. But it's, it's uh, gradually been lost in pretty much every population except for Amish and Old Order Mennonite. So today, it's sort of synonymous with Amish and Old Order Mennonite populations, but again, if we went back 200 years or so, um, its it, its origins and its uh, speakership were much wider than that. He still speaks it at home. His children still speak it. So, how large of a community do I need to think about when I think of him? Um, I don't know. If you're in an online class with him, you should ask him. I, I don't. I mean, I, I I know that this is. I I know the name. I've seen some of his videos. This is a, a passion of his. And there is there is the Pennsylvania German. Uh, study center again at Kutztown University in Berks County um, that tends to connect with Pennsylvania Dutch speakers who are not of Anabaptist background, but numerically I'm just not sure uh, who they are. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much. Um, my wife and I grew up in Worcester, Pennsylvania, so we're very familiar with, uh, with New Wilmington live near Cleveland, so we've got Geauga County, and then of course Walnut Creek, Sugar Creek area. Um, I'm curious, just as in the, I wonder if it's in the Protestant religions, there are differences in theology from, from sect to sect. Are there differences in the Amish uh, theology from community to community? That's a good question, a fair question. Uh, it's a question I'm tempted to punt to Amish folks who are in the audience uh, here. Um, because, I mean, I do, I, I genuinely hesitate to answer because I'm not, um, I, I'm not sure how um, Amish people would necessarily answer that question. I mean, on the one hand, there is a common confession of faith. It's known as the Dortrecht Confession. Uh, it was a confession drawn up by some Dutch Mennonites in 1632. Um, and so that is the standard, talk about the 18 articles. Uh, that is common across all of these churches. Um, you know, you would find uh, certainly different emphases on um, um, hmm. uh, uh, so, for example, uh, since 1966, with the formation of the New Order, so-called New Order Amish, or the Amish Fellowship in Ohio, which now has um, districts elsewhere, including uh, here in Sarasota, there, um, there would be um, an interest in talking a little bit more about uh, the assurance of salvation, although a lot of New Order folks would be a little uncomfortable with that language, but would want to, to, to maybe sort of move kind of in that direction, as opposed to a more um, 
more traditionalist old order view that would say in order to sort of respect uh, divine providence any discussion of one's salvation is is just off the table because that's that becomes um, human speculation of the mind of God so uh, and there there and, and I, I even what I just said there trying to sort of parse that out those those positions are much more nuanced uh, than, than I, uh, so people will talk about a living hope of salvation, some people will not want to talk about that at all, uh, I mean like not want to use that kind of language. So that might be an example of where depending who you're talking to, the kind of language they would feel comfortable using um, would be an example of, of, uh, of a difference. Um, there are... Um, there, in terms of ecclesiology, there are some Amish communities that are known for, oh, kind of vesting more, kind of more, uh, being a bit more hierarchical and in investing more authority in in ministers and bishops than others. But that's I don't know if that's exactly uh, if that's exactly what you're asking about. But I mean, you you'll, you'll see you'd see some of those kind of differences. There's also a, um, there's a growing or, or a growing network of um, a, a fellowship of um, sort of an old order Amish subgroup um, with some some people say sort of tendency is new order others say no it's not uh, depends who you talk to uh, the so-called Michigan Amish fellowship um, so you know just to be to be because this is obvious not all Michigan Amish are Michigan Amish and not all Michigan Amish live in Michigan so um, it's, it's, it's a little bit like you know Southern, Southern Baptist not all Southern Baptists live in the south and not all Baptists in the south are Southern Baptists but there are Southern Baptists right so uh, there's a there's there's a certain it started in Michigan so there's like a, a circle of churches called the Michigan Fellowship and they now also have they have um, church districts in Maine and Kentucky and Montana and uh, Missouri and anyway um, but um, that's I don't know that I would necessarily say it's uh, kind of theological differences but there there's there there would be different emphases uh, in that group on um, they would tend to talk about things like clean living which might mean you know um, much more restricted youth activities or much more restrictive reading matter that would be allowed in the home or things like that and those might not even be the best examples but uh, they would probably have better examples than that, but um, that's they, they also have a different way of thinking about settlement growth So they don't like um, any particular settlement to be more than one church district. So if they're going to You know if the church grows large enough that in most other Amish communities you would divide You you'd divide the church district and make two from one and they would do that But how they would do that would be they would um, have like half the people move away uh, physically and like start start another district somewhere else and they do that both because they view it as a actually a kind of um, not necessarily their language but we might say sort of a mission strategy of, of letting letting their witness be more geographically diverse and also because they believe that some of the problems with the opposite of uh, clean living whatever we might call that uh, result from settlements that are too large and um, which the youth groups get too large and people don't know each other well enough and so on. So um, they also tend to actually vet uh, whether you can move in to one of their communities, which is quite unusual in the Amish world. So that's an example of a sort of, uh, a sort of, of um, uh, Amish subgroup that uh, is relatively, of relatively recent origin. I wanted to ask about Florida, since um, the podium made it hard to see the settlements in Florida, but most of them look to be more in the north. And so I just was curious about, are there other snowbird kind of populations? Is this unusual? How do, how do you sort of see Florida in the midst of all the other populations? Yeah, uh, Sarasota is really unusual, and I, maybe I don't have to <laughs> say that to this, to this crowd. You all know that. It's yeah, special. Like uh, it's it's right. Yes, it's special in so many ways, uh, as we heard here from the front row. Um, um, so um, some of the other uh, southern communities. So B uh, B County, Texas. Uh, the only Amish community right now in Texas is also a little unusual. I don't think I could be wrong about that. Probably I'm wrong about this, but I don't think anyone there actually owns land. They all rent land, but they've been there for a long time. But people rent land and they tend to work as um, 
um, kind of farm managers for on, on kind of larger non Amish owned farms. Um, uh, I don't know what I don't know enough about the new settlement that's taking shape in Alabama. Uh, there's one settlement in Mississippi that is um, a settlement of of uh, 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 of uh, the so-called Schwarzenegger Amish, which are probably one of the yeah like like the the most traditionalist to use that language uh, Amish subgroup. Um, so you you're not going to see any of them here in Sarasota. So they 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 kind of live in the south in Mississippi, but they're not snowbirds and they're not going to come here. Um, and in fact, most of the Schwarzenegger and some of the other I mean there's. Many of these are sort of informal names for these groups. So, like the, the Angadine, Michigan group, are informally known as the Troyer Amish. So, like, and there's the Troyer groups and the Schwarzenegger groups tend to the 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 the, the Schwarzenegger group in in Mississippi is a little unusual because those folks tend to like the more northern um, location. So, northern Minnesota, uh, northern Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, northern New York, uh, far upstate Vermont, some in. Uh, New Brunswick, I think, is a sort of tribute me in, in part because sorry, where I'm going with this, in part because um, they still rely a lot on ice. For example, do a lot of home butchering in the winter, and uh, they actually they, they they find a cold temperature to be uh, um, kind of necessary for their lifestyle. Uh, they need to be in a cold place for at least part of the year. So another reason why coming to Sarasota in the winter would not work for them. They would get home and they'd have no ice. <laughs> Could you talk just a bit more about the Amish school system in terms of the culture that supports and forms uh, the life inside the school and, and the how, how the community supports uh, that system. Um, I, I've been a high school teacher for many years uh, in the American public school system, which uh, some say um, developed in its present form to support the industrialized society and the assembly line, as you described it, with. Uh, classes individualized 45 minutes and a bell rings and everybody goes to the next place and so on. How does that work inside the Amish schools? They, uh, they don't follow the typical American system. They might only have a few years. Some communities might have many more years for the children to attend school. And how does the community support that system? If you could talk about that culture a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, try to um, a bit. So Amish schools all uh, go through eighth grade. Um, so they're they're all grades one to eight. Um, uh, there you know, slight you know variation grades. Like in in the Midwest, it's not uncommon for it to be a two room school, and you might have grades one to four, and then in one room and five to eight in another. Uh, other places, it's a one room school, grades one to eight, uh, all in the same room. Um, generally, there's uh, always two adults there, a teacher and a teacher's assistant. The teacher's assistant to an earlier question is someone sometimes who's a teacher in training, uh, someone who's thinking about being a teacher maybe the next year. Um, not in every case, sometimes there's only one teacher, but there's, there's often two, a teacher and a teacher's aide. And um, the curriculum, so I sometimes, so I'm not a specialist in the history of, of education, so I could, be, I could be wrong about this, but I, I um, often describe the Amish curriculum as not necessarily uh, what many contemporary Americans think of as a parochial school curriculum. Like there's no formal religion class in an Amish There's no school. Bibles? It's, it's more um, like an old-fashioned public school curriculum. Like a public school, so in, and like with the Pennsylvania uh, uh, agreement in, in 1955. Uh, basically, they were saying we want to, we kind of like the way the public schools were and we want to keep doing that. So the curriculum is um, more like a circa 1940 Pennsylvania public school. So uh, that's why it's all in English. Um, some of the upper grades will have a, a, a German reading class, but um, it focuses on like reading, writing, uh, as in handwriting. <laughs> uh, so like there's, there's penmanship classes, uh, reading, grammar, uh, spelling, um, mathematics, um, including uh, some fractions and decimals and some basic, um, you know, 
pie charts and graphs and things, but really not much beyond what we would consider to be pre-algebra. Uh, geography, um, science would be like, uh, it's often called nature study. Um, and there's some interest, as a sort of a side note, but there's some interesting, uh, and some of this, like I, I mentioned Kay Moyer, I mean, she'll say, you know, there's some, some interesting things in Amish school science curriculum, they don't call it science curriculum, but like, um, like kids often, know what watershed they live in um, which for a lot of you know the rest of us of any age aren't really clear on what that is which is a problem you know in terms of like you know uh, all sorts of environmental <laughs> issues if we don't know what 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 watershed we're in so so there's it's um it, but but it's it's more yeah it's it's uh yeah nature study it's not broadly speaking there's an emphasis i would say on problem solving not critical thinking and that may be a distinction that we tend to like blend together, but so it's, it's not critical thinking, but it is definitely um, kind of focused on problem solving, I would say. Um, so that's a, a little bit of what the, like what the, the school day um, is like. That's common. Now, what varies then from community to community and from among some different Amish subgroups is that um, the kinds of textbooks that are used, uh, so in the very conservative, say, Swartz and Trooper schools, they may still use like cast off textbooks that are literally 60 years old. Uh, other uh, Amish schools are using newer Amish produced textbooks. Some Amish schools are using newer textbooks, in some cases, that are produced for Christian homeschoolers, but it's not homeschool, but they're, they're maybe using some of those books in some cases. Um, in some Amish communities, uh, students at the end of the year all take the um, Iowa test of basic skills, that's not exactly the name, but you know, like as a standardized test and they track that. Other Amish schools, they never do that. Um, as far as what's the culture that supports this, I mean, it's a, it's a culture of um, generally of, of families and communities uh, financially and otherwise supporting the schools and the teachers and the school is always open for visitors, not necessarily for like me or you, but I mean, it's not, um, Amish teachers have all told me that it is a rare week that they don't have at least, you know, several visitors who just stop in, usually unannounced. Uh, Amish, like usually parents, grandparents, um, or parents or grandparents or friends of the teacher <laughs> or of any of the students. So I know uh, Amish grandparents who make it a point of visiting uh, in the fall and in the spring, at least once, every school that any of their grandchildren are in. And they might have 56 grandchildren in school, so they're visiting a bunch of schools, right? Um, and so they're just like showing up, and they sit in the back for like an hour or two, they observe, they don't necessarily say anything. Uh, sometimes, if, sometimes if they're there, the teacher will say, hey, let's, like, as a class, let's uh, sing a song for so-and-so's grandparents because they're here. So they, they might be acknowledged in that way, but um, they're there, they're present, they're watching what's happening. Um, so that's, that's maybe the best way to describe the general uh, culture of support, I would say. Thank you. I'm from Adams County, Indiana, where there is a Amish community there. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if um, an Amish individual decides to leave the Amish practice, mm -hmm. that individual, or in fact the family, is shunned. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, <clears throat> is that a common practice throughout all the Amish communities, or is that just more directly as a result of where I live and grew up? Yeah, thanks, good question. Um, so um, I would say that, um, uh, one one way that I uh, talk about this, I would say that shunning is very real and very rare. So when I said that um, anywhere from 85 to 90 percent of children uh, born to Amish parents nowadays join the Amish church, that other 10 to 15 percent, very few of the, I don't mean that those other 10 to 15 percent are in the van and are, are shunned. Shunning applies only to individuals who join the church and then subsequently leave. So when I was giving those retention numbers, um, almost all of those folks who aren't part of the church never joined in the first place. And not being a member, uh, they can't be excommunicated any more than you could be, right? So, um, so, so shunning is very real and very serious uh, and, and certainly does happen, but it's, 
it's in um, very particular cases, and so in percentage terms, it doesn't really rise to even the 1% level. Now, if you're an individual or a family in that situation, I'm sure it's no, you know, it's cold comfort to say, well, you're less than 1%. I don't mean it that way. <laughs> that's, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that in terms of, so a, a different way of putting it. So in 1955, the Broadway musical, Plain and Fancy, which is kind of uh, mercifully faded from, from popular memory, uh, gave this impression, so there's like partway through sort of the climax of scene one before you break for the intermission, like Papa Yoder gets mad at someone and turns around and says, you're shunned. And for a while, that, that uh, lingered in popular American imagination that every Amish person wakes up every day wondering if like, they're gonna like look at someone crosswise and get shunned. Uh, so that's not, you know, that's, that's, that's not how it works. But it, is, but it certainly is very real in cases where it happens. Now, we could get into another level of detail, which is uh, that in, in the community, 